This is Though the Anthem 360, and I'm Anderson Cooper. I mean, Corey Baker. This is Corey Baker, and this is the Though the Anthem podcast. That was very well put together for the panic that I saw on the other side of the Zoom call before I switched seats here. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Rob. Welcome to episode 360 of the O the Anthem podcast, coming to you from all over LA, of course. But Corey is there in the hashtag OTA LA studios, high above the 110 freeway in downtown Los Angeles, California. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for listening on your podcatchers. The easiest way, anchor.fm forward slash O the Anthem. And yeah, it's, so the a, it's that always we, funny we, because, we <laughs> because, you know, like it's the... I always like the Aaron Sorkin line when he was talking about like why he writes certain shows and he's just like, I always like the five minutes right before something happens, like five minutes before the president walks onto the stage, five minutes before the start of sports center, five minutes before the start of SNL, that type of moment. Uh, and that was definitely just that for me with <laughs> <laughs> a scurry. So, the, uh, what basically what happened is it hit the intro song for those of you who hang out for the intro uh, on our live recordings, which happen on Mondays. Of course, uh, you can find those on Twitch, Facebook, uh, YouTube, all over the place, uh, and the regular episode on Tuesday on uh But uh, I have two screens open. OBS mm-hmm. is how we run the show. And we are, of course, doing a Zoom call for our call portions of this. And I have it on, I, as I'm transitioning off of the Zoom call, I just see panic happening <laughs> on the other side of the call. And I'm like... I'm flipping over at zero, so I hope he's ready. Uh, <laughs> and then I go to it, and you're just sitting there stoutly, just like, just hello, ready. everyone. <laughs> like, the, I don't know what happened in the 10 seconds I flipped away. But, but in a newsman mode, man. I got to Professional. <laughs> Fuck it, we'll do it live! <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, a lot of stuff to talk about this week. Although, I have to say, Corey, I don't know if you feel this. I also feel like it's slowing down. Like we're getting into the place where it's almost back to normal with the number of topics, with the things that are going on. We didn't almost have a war in three different countries and also an insurrection at home in the same week. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's definitely, uh, it feels like we're going to the before times as far as news is concerned. But uh, I don't know if you've noticed this. I haven't been watching a lot of uh, news here recently, but it seems like, there's been more of an effort to try and eventize like even little tiny things because you know during the trump years we had insurrections we had <laughs> crisis every day crisis every day like you know like what's going on with the migrants at the border what's happening with you know the muslim ban like every day it was something new and it was some big huge flashy like you know any one of these things would have been the biggest presidential scandal of any other president's life it's a and Tuesday. It's a Tuesday for Trump. And now we're back in Biden and it feels like boring and normal and new. And at the same time, I just feel like people at like CNN are just like, come on, let's fucking skewer him for something. <laughs> he didn't bring so his usually, pen with him. Let's spend four hours on him not bringing his pen with him. I, I usually go through the same or I used to go through the same uh, kind of wake up procedure, which is the third or fourth alarm goes off at 850 or so uh, after I've ignored or slept through two or three of them. And then. I will sit up and like give 10 minutes and then right about nine o'clock TV goes on to CNN, but I would come into Aaron Burnett every morning, like breaking news. And I'm like, Oh God, what's happened? What's happened? But then I realized the last three, three weeks, it's just been like breaking news, Biden going on a trip to Houston this morning. And I'm like, (laughs) Really, Aaron? Is this where we are? It was really funny because with the uh, with Wolf Blitzer with with the Situation Room. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, I I don't know how familiar the people are with the Situation Room, but it starts with the theme song, like the dun 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 dun, dun, dun and then immediately segues into breaking news. And then Wolf yes. Blitzer is there with his paper, and he's just like, you know, like turmoil today in Washington. You know, like whatever the breaking news is. Uh, there was a it's day, not, and it's almost there never was a breaking. day like two weeks ago where it was, yeah, it's like almost never breaking news. It's like milk is up to three dollars a gallon. <laughs> it's just like, but like it's almost never breaking news. Sometimes it is, but it's almost never breaking news. But they still have the drop all the time. And then like three weeks ago, I think I, I had Wolf on like when it was transitioning to his show, and it was just like the theme song that it was just like, "Hi, I'm Wolf Blitzer in the Situation Room." I'm like, no breaking news, like <laughs> clutching my pearls, like is nothing wrong in the world. <laughs> No, because he, now he's smart. He's dropped it in the middle. He waits like seven minutes in and be like, and we're coming to breaking news here in the Washington <laughs> yeah. newsroom. We're going to go to, uh, what's her name? The, uh, the hot girl who works at the uh, the White House. Chris and Collins? No, that was my impression of Wolf. He doesn't remember her name. But he's like, the hot girl who works at the White House. <laughs> and then you were asking me questions. You just put me out there. Now, I, now everyone knows who I think the hot girl at CNN is. 
By the way, not a lot of options. Know. Not a lot. Yeah, of we options. all know who the hot girl is at CNN. Um, by the way, I'm really of, happy she's the chief White House now. A lot of lot of very pretty women, but not I wouldn't categorize as hot women. That's a that's a, a distinction of one I think at CNN there. Um, yeah. You can see a lot more now. Speaking but, of, uh, <laughs> noticeably, I was going to say, but noticeably, nothing to talk about this week because the only thing that happened was the Golden Globe. So uh, anyway, <laughs> moving on to the. Uh... There's other things. We have other things. Don't worry. Uh, yeah. But let's start with the Golden Globes because uh, that just happened last night uh, all across the country because and of we the are Zoom up on format. It. Yeah. Uh, Corey and I both did not watch it. So we got this morning's update news. We know exactly what happened during the I, show. So. I remember somebody asked me about the Golden Globes one. It must have been like two, three years ago or something like that. And they were just like, oh, the Golden Globes are tonight. That's that's a that's a big night in Hollywood, isn't it? And I'm just like, mm, yeah, eh, sure. I guess. <laughs> like, it's on the same level as the Grammys. Like, they can be bought. Like, it's not a a true indication of the best of the best. Because the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, who is the voting body of the Golden Globes is notoriously known for being awful judgments of character. And a lot of the times it seems like it, it, it's like the FIFA of Hollywood, you know, like they're, yeah, it yeah. feels so corrupt. Like 14 people have an incredible amount of influence over what happens in the entire organization. Uh, and no I, black I maybe people. gave, I was going to say, I maybe gave <laughs> one fuck about the Golden Globes until I saw the story this week that was like, Oh, there are zero people of color in this at all. And the only people of color are kind of it's it's like um, they're in their country. They are the majority. Therefore, mm. you're not really people of color because you're coming from like you're Spanish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're Hispanic because you're from Spain. But you're like. Well, I mean, I mean, all the people from Latin America know what I mean when yeah. I say you're, you're you're Spanish from Spain. They know what the difference yeah. is. Like you're, you're not really uh, you're not a Latino. So there there's a. There was a story that came out this week that said that of the 87 members of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, none of them were people of color. Yeah. And my surprise was not the fact that there were no members of color, even though you would think at this point they would know <laughs> to at least have like a couple token people in there to be like, oh, no, we got Rick or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of <laughs> like a lot of racist places, institutions do. That might be the story uh, I saw. That was like, well, we have a member from Spain, and I look at the guy, and I'm like, mm, <laughs> Donald Trump's Hispanic. not racist. He's got Ben Carson. It's like that doesn't count. Uh, yeah, I mean, like you know, it, I think what surprised me more was it was only 87 members. I knew it wasn't like a oh, yeah. huge voting board, but like the Academy is filled with, you know, thousands. thousands of people who vote, and like you know, they have it separated so that like. You know, if you were a, a person in sound, then you get to vote on sound awards and, you know, like cinematographers on the cinematography, so on and so forth, and actors on acting. Uh, it's just 87 people, which is, I knew it was not a lot of people, but that's that's really not a lot of people. <laughs> no. it's, it's amazing that there's so much influence uh, uh, that comes it from makes it, the stupid actions of 87 people. It's like. It makes sense though that it can be bought because yeah. thousands of people in the academy are like, oh, well, I mean, we got to influence them somehow, but you have to do it on a big scale. 87 people is like, I want to fly 20 of you somewhere for a nice weekend. And oh, I got a quarter. I got a quarter of the voting block yeah. of the entire, uh, the entire Well, board, not only so. that, I, I, I feel like, so like one of the stories that had come out during this uh, run, this <laughs> awards run, was that the producers of Emily in Paris, which was a Netflix show that, that was people apparently really don't like. <laughs> did you watch seen, it? No, I haven't seen it. Now, nah, somebody told me uh, I said like, oh, you know, there's a couple of things like Netflix keeps recommending me this uh, Emily in Paris show, so maybe I looked at it, and they were like, no, don't, <laughs> don't watch it. And I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> that's a pretty cool. It's not even a like. Here's why you might or might not like it. It's like, nope, don't don't watch it. It's just it looked like so. Sex in the City without the friendship. That, uh, they, that, <laughs> like, they described it as if Samantha is it Samantha? No, who's Carrie? the main character? Carrie, if Carrie, moved I mean, to I don't New know. York, <laughs> <laughs> I asked the one person on this podcast who would know. Uh, but if Carrie moved to a new city and then basically like didn't make friends, like just enjoyed New York City for being New York, which I'm sure is fun, but like not a show. It's, yeah, that's Seinfeld, and Seinfeld's <laughs> only really good because of the friends that yeah. are involved. I don't know. Uh, apparently, they flew like you know 
twenty five members of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association to Paris and put them up in a nice hotel and you know wined and dined them. And now all of a sudden, Emily in Paris is nominated for a couple of awards, which it totally doesn't deserve, according to almost anyone I've talked to about the show. Not to say yeah. that the people involved aren't doing what they can to make a good show and all, but like you know, apparently it wasn't to the level of award winning content. What, uh, maybe it, ten ten shows get nominated, and this is one of the ten best shows of the yeah. year. Well, and there's people who are like, you know, like uh, <laughs> your nominations are against like Shit's Creek and stuff like that. So maybe you, you you can buy a nomination, but you can't necessarily buy enough goodwill <laughs> to put you over a show that should win either. You know, like. But it's Golden Globe nominated. She's the Golden Globe nominated actress, and it, you'll use nominated forever, so it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Matter. I mean, it, it, it's the, nothing to worry about. They're, all their careers will be fine. And I'm sure it was money well spent as far yeah. as Netflix is concerned. I just... Uh, and honestly, even if I hear people talking about how bad a show it is, some of those shows I still watch because yeah. I'm just like, I want to see what kind of train wreck this is. Yeah. I watched Shit's Creek first because somebody said they hated it so much, and I asked them... Well, did you like, you know, like Boys in the Hall or like other Canadian comedy mm-hmm. kind of stuff? Kids in the Hall. And yeah. Kids in the Hall. Sorry, yes. Kids in the Hall. Uh, Boys in the Hood. Yeah, different, <laughs> different, uh, different, different thing. Uh, and they were like, Kids in the Hall, what's that? And I was like, okay, I'm going to watch this because, mm-hmm. one, I don't think you know what you're talking about. And, two, I don't trust your judgment on anything now. So yeah. I'll go see it. And if it's horrible, maybe I'll hate watch it a little bit until it runs out of, you know, flavor. If they, if they I loved it. If they said, if they responded yes to Kids in the Hall, I would be like, all right, well, how about SCTV? That's how you really test them on their Canadianism. Yeah, that's the SNL of the the Great White North, right? Yeah, John Candy and Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara and everybody. There you go. Rick Moranis. But I would like to point out, since you brought it up, that uh, Corey had not watched Schitt's Creek until maybe four weeks ago when someone... Oh, it was before. It, it was longer than played it for <laughs> yeah. them. No, wait, that's right. That's right. You watched a little bit of it, and you said, "Eh, I didn't really like it." And I no, said, I d- "Let's watch and push through." No, I, I hadn't watched it. I, I was. I heard. I heard other people say it's one of those ones where you have to like, sort of. Uh, the first season is good, but it's not until they really find their their path that the mm-hmm. show really takes off. Yes. Uh, and I just never started. So, <laughs> but so I know. forcibly made them start. We watched. Two episodes together, maybe, and the next time I came over, like four days later, like, oh yeah, so we watched the first and second seasons, and uh, we're entering the third season. I'm like, okay, well, this train has left the station. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, also, I think I have admitted on the show before, and I will continue to that Daniel Levy uh, is one of the only men in this world that I would go gay for, and that is a weird thing to say because I, I will admit, I think he would admit he's not one of the most attractive men in the world, but I don't know, just. Everything about his personality I love and I wish I had. Just his ability to be like, fuck you, I don't care, and I'm going to do what I want, and I'm very funny, and also marginally good looking. I think we're both like sixes, and I think it's a good match. We're both funny. We have a bad, like a weird sense of humor. We're both sixes. What I'm saying is, Daniel, if you're out there uh, and you're still single, I mean, just give me a call if you're in LA. We'll see what happens. I just can't wait. I'm going to have to make a note of this particular episode. <laughs> not not because like I feel like this will this will. <laughs> You know, I don't care about the whole the gay fantasy thing going on here. I just want to. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I have this clipped off for when the two of you eventually get married one day. And like, you know, like, oh, you're just like, I did. I didn't believe in love until Daniel came along. Uh, I was going to say, I thought you were going to clip it so that at one point when we are with, like meet him in person, and we're, we become friends. And we hey, watch out. this. And my my wife. <laughs> My 22-year-old USC graduate wife is in the other room, and you're like, oh, hey, Candy, come here for a second. Dan, you're going to love this. Candy, let's watch this. And then uh, you play the awkward clip where I admit on the show that I'm secretly in love with him in front of my wife and uh, our new friend, Daniel. I'm doing that thing where I'm just like, it was like five minutes into the episode. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just trying to skip ahead and find it. So, by the way, uh, Schitt's Creek Creek won uh, Golden Globe, and basically the only thing I heard about during the whole show was just like, well, well well-deserved. Oh, and uh, Haley Kuko. uh, Kaylee. Kaylee Kuko? Yeah. Haley? Kaylee. Kaylee. Kaylee Kuko didn't win. Uh, So she, like, posted on Instagram her, like, sad, I'm in the dress and I'm sad picture. Mm. Other than that. Um, It mostly mostly didn't matter. And we're in L.A., and not anybody seemed to care. 
Uh, so that tells you how much I mean, little it matters. It, it's it's one of the weirdest things. Just and, and we'll finish on this. But like as far as a Hollywood perspective goes, uh, it's good to have a Golden Globe win because it it helps propel you into a front runner status in the Oscars. So yeah, even Schitt's though Creek, now number number one in the Oscar, <laughs> well for the movies obviously, not the <laughs> TV. Uh, <laughs> but like because the the Golden Globes are right before the Oscars happen. So like a, a movie that wins a lot of Golden Globes will be seen as a favorable Oscar contender going forward. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's just so like I, I don't know it, it it's just like such a weird thing because it feels so bought and paid for that it's like yeah I could uh, you know my uh, my film is really good and it might get nominated for an Oscar but I have to go to like I have to go to Arco every day this week and get tabs from the bottom <laughs> of this box in order to be considered like. It's like there's a step that goes into it. Like I'm not saying you have to go to Arco every day and buy the buy the special Oscar box, but you know saying. it would help out a lot. You know, Guillermo yeah. del Toro came in with 300 Oscar boxes the other day, so I'm like, oh fuck. <laughs> um, but also, do you think that the Oscars being a little further in the year now is going to start changing that? Hopefully, because the Oscars aren't next week. It's not like the two week separation anymore. It's like a, a a month and a half, I think now. No, I I think that I think this will pretty much remain the same i i more than anything what it what it, it'll do will probably lessen the impact of the golden globes uh mm-hmm. but it will a winner will always sort of dominate news stories because somebody wants to write the headline tomorrow you know type in golden globes in your in google and look at the news articles and it'll say the five shows that won big or the five movies that were big winners and it'll be way less about like you know what the host said or what this guest said or what, you know, happened here, unless there's some big moment like uh, Daniel Kaluuya getting his mic, mi- uh, mic muted was <laughs> like, you know, like a funny thing that happened during the zoom style telecast. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that, that beyond that, they'll talk about the, the people who won big and then that'll become a point of contention going forward as far as like Oscar talk. So I think it'll always be there to some extent. Well, I would just like to announce then that I'm going to go ahead and start a new show starting next year. Uh, The awards are going to be given out exactly on the midpoint between the Golden Globes (laughs) and the uh, Oscars. Yeah. I'm going to call them the Corbett's. I'm going to be giving out a a golden, uh, a golden, a golden, uh, a golden man hurrying to get something done right before the show's (laughs) done. Uh, let's see. I, what I really want is to take a photo, uh, like a screen grab of that ponytail you had before we started. And that's going to be the statue uh, that I'm going to give out to people. And I'll just let you know from the beginning, I can be bought and paid for. It's going to be the most influential award to win. But Not a ponytail, a man bun. There's a distinction. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> man bun. My fault. Um, but uh, yeah, speaking of embarrassing things that men have done in the last uh, you know 24 hours, uh, also in the news is Andrew Cuomo. Uh, one time uh, runner up for uh, what, what do we call it? The daddy quarantine, daddy quarantine COVID. daddy, quarantine daddy. There you yeah. go. Uh, now, oh, he has fallen so very far because uh, we call him quarantine daddy as a joke, but apparently he likes other people to call him daddy for real. So, <laughs> well, that we is. don't know all the, <laughs> we don't know all the details for sure, but uh, wouldn't I mean, be, he looks like the kind unlikely. of guy. He looks like the kind of guy who gets into that kind of thing listen if he's, you either, are he's either the type of guy who who wants you to call him daddy or he's the 180 percent polar opposite he's just he like, dresses like a baby or no like he, on. like you know like the door closes and he's just like i like to be called a princess if you don't mind like <laughs> <laughs> uh but yes cuomo uh he we talked about uh the mishandling of the uh <laughs> the deaths that happened in uh, nursing homes that was the misfiling don't say it wasn't mishandled it was misfiled okay well i mean either way it was miss something <laughs> um and now we have a couple allegations of sexual harassment or abuse uh against cuomo uh one of the stories was you know like a, rubbing a, his hand on the backless gown of some woman and then uh uh like saying I want to kiss you or something like that. It's you know, you're so pretty I could kiss you. Yeah, it, I, it was something it could be. Listen, the, these guys, uh, and by these guys, I'm not going to say that I'm not one of them. Are really good at knowing what the, the line that, is. Yeah, that 
listen, I could talk my way out of this if my girlfriend was to come over here and hear me say this to you. I'd be like, what? Listen, you said when we walked in, she looked very beautiful. I'm just saying, like, yeah, you're so beautiful, I could kiss you. That's just, that's a thing people say. Like, that's not a thing people say. Like, oh, it's a thing my people say. All right, I don't know what to tell you. But then yeah. if she takes or it like the right the, way. Or the, like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just a handsy person. I like to touch people. Like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, there's no excuse in COVID. There's no more excuse. <laughs> I don't want those people around me anymore. Don't touch me. Keep your fucking hands to yourself. Uh, I. I think this, the lesson that we should always take from this is don't ever trust anybody. And I'm not saying that I believed like Andrew Cuomo was some white knight who was going to do everything right because he had never proven himself to be that person. And look but at his like, brother. <laughs> look at his brother. <sighs> but I mean, like, it's just one of those, like, I can't, like, how could you, people who have one note, it's funny to see how quickly they get in trouble and then can't wriggle free. Uh, his yeah. whole thing is like, you know, I'm the tough guy. I'm the tough New York guy who's going to handle things. You know, like he's the bully kind of thing. And when you don't have a note to go to where you're sorry and, you know, like you made, you need to make amends for something, bully doesn't work anymore. You have to, no. you have to be able to, like from time to time. I think like Hogan is actually probably a good, uh, line for this because sometimes he'll talk he, he's usually pretty even keeled and when he needs to say something serious he has like the serious demeanor to him but if he needs to you know be tough he's also got that tough guy move that he can go to Drops so it's more, an yeah it's like a little, a little spectrum of <laughs> yeah of how serious he is um when you're he's one also note, got little kids by the way and i think there's something about that like his daughters were like 10 or something when he became governor mm. so he had that like look at me i'm a caring father but i could drop that voice and be very much stern if you want me to yeah i could to. go to your room like i got yeah. it in me don't worry about it. doesn't mean i don't love you but yeah. i need to be stern right now i i i don't know what to say about cuomo it, i think that this is the type of these are the compounding problems that usually lead to somebody having to resign or if not resign, at least get to the point where it becomes so difficult for you to run for re-election that you can't really, you just gracefully back out. You're, <laughs> I'm going to spend time with my kids or whatever. Like, Well, and I mean, listen, obviously neither of us are from New York. Uh, we spent time there, but not in a long time. And the reason I included it is because we've talked for, for weeks now kind of about the memory of American people. And mm. I think number one, we can certifiably say the weekly uh, press conferences will end because no matter what he talks about, the questions that come out after it will be like, tell us about Jennifer Flowers or whatever the girl's name is, but you know what I mean? Um, and more than that, his reelection is 2022. He's, he's up for reelection in the fall in two years, less than two years. Well, one year, God, man, <laughs> election cycles are so close together. Um, but if he can recover and run and win, then I think the chances of like Trump and all of the like Cruz and all these guys surviving and re getting reelected is high. If, if he runs and loses, especially, but also if he's just like, you know what, I'm done with politics. I'm going to take a step back. I think it's a good sign that maybe polling is saying people's memories are going all the way through this COVID time and into the future and saying, Hey, hey, hey yeah, you did an okay job with COVID kind of you lied to us, but also you groped a bunch of people and maybe that's not okay. Um, and maybe that'll help us in 2024. With the I mean, election. I don't know if it's necessarily indicative of, of anything regarding the other side, just because New York is very Democratic heavy. Like, mm -hmm. I, like I could you could say to me that Gavin Newsom is going to be put into the recall election thing. Like, it, it's yeah. going to get to the point where there's enough votes. Uh, yes, update it uh, looking more and more likely every single day. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah, but. we'll see. We'll talk about it when it happens. Uh, but in the meantime, like, you know, it, it, it looks like it could happen. But at the same time, like, you know, Faulkner from San Diego isn't going to become governor. Like, it, there's not enough desire for a Republican to become governor that if it was yeah. a Republican versus a Democrat, the Democrat would win <laughs> in California every time. The, what they're hoping for is that 197 people decide to run for governor and, you know, a bunch of really good Democratic <laughs> candidates are all running at the same time. Yeah, and then they the all vote. split the vote. And then, you know, Faulkner comes in with his 10 percent of the vote, which is the majority. And the problem know, is, it. you know, judging by uh, CPAC, which also happened this week, 
the Republicans can't seem to figure out what kind of party they are, because I've been hearing for weeks that they are not the party of Trump, but uh, seemed like all I'll say is this. Uh, the party of the Bible, the party that's supposed to be very conservative and Bible loving, built a golden image yeah. of a man at their festival, which I'm pretty sure is covered real early in that book. Uh, and they just did seem to ignore that part of it, just like the rest of it. The uh, worshiping of false idols is something that uh, it wasn't in Corinthians. So people don't know. Like that's, <laughs> that's where all the. It that's is where, the Old Testament. That's where all the uh, that's where the uh, judgment of other people comes in. That's that's what Christians are Ooh, about no. these days. No, no, the New Testament is all like good and love. You'd think these guys who are all about like fire and brimstone would love Old Testament God, where he's like, "This city really pissed me off." <laughs> Boom, you're done, <laughs> off the face of the earth. Happens in the same book, yeah. the Golden Idol, and that that whole city being blown up. But uh, hear him talk a lot about Sodom and Gomorrah. Also, see him build golden statues so, yeah very weird very weird I, cpac is such a weird thing because it's like uh it's kind of like a cosplay convention for the <laughs> republican <laughs> wonks like yeah like okay so i remember when we were at hofstra the hofstra republicans were trying to organize like a a group trip to cpac for anyone who wanted to yeah. go uh and even though at the time I was a member of that Hofstra Republican thing, and even though I was registered as a Republican at that time, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. even though I'm a, a, I was a political science major and certainly wonky, I wanted nothing to do with that thing because it's so, so fucking weird. Like, how many goddamn times can you sing that same Lee Greenwood song over and over and over again and act like you're doing something important? Like that was my that was my big problem, and it was like you watched. Sorry, you you watched the Boy State documentary, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm realizing as you were saying that that like it really is Boy State for it's Texas Boy State where it's like all Republicans, even the Democrats are super kind of conservative. It's just let's go. It's a frat boys having fun it's, together. See, but it's not. Place. It's almost not even that. It's like uh, like I kind of think of it like Orioles Fan Fest. Like if it was like. It was Orioles Fan Fest for Republican members of Congress yeah. and the Senate. Like, I'm going there hoping I get an autograph from Ted Cruz. Like, But it's not even all Republicans. Because, again, my, what I saw this year, at least, was that, like, there were a lot of people on CNN saying, like, no, no, I'm, I, you would usually attend CPAC. In fact, uh, my husband was a founding member of CPAC back in the 80s. But yeah. uh, I, when I saw the slate of uh, speakers, I decided this year wasn't going to be for me. Because it's it's skewing so far to the right. Well, I mean, way back when, back when I was thinking about going, or like when it was mentioned to me about going to CPAC. 20 was, years ago, you mean? Yeah. About, about 20 years ago? It was, <laughs> it was like a place where like the libertarian elite would get together and meet up for a little while. Because like they, the straw poll is always like a big thing about CPAC. And yeah. for every single year for decades, it was some combination of Ron or Rand Paul who would win that thing. <laughs> Because the libertarian wing of CPAC was, like, so fucking heavy. And yeah. then as soon as it became the Tea Party, it became more of, like, a Tea Party event. But certainly a, a good degree of libertarians who were, like, still hanging out. But keep out. in mind, when the Tea Party came in, they brought the Koch brothers with them. Because yeah. the Tea Party was the Koch brothers. And it also started skewing off to this, like, corporate event. Right. And, uh... That's when the libertarians, for in, in major part, who weren't Tea Partiers, were like, this is not our show anymore. And we've continued to skew off on that exit. <laughs> One libertarian, like, standing in the middle of the 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 big hotel they have in D.C. or wherever it is, and they're just like, what was so wrong about the Ramada? It was cheap. <laughs> people liked it. The beds were clean. <laughs> I don't need to have this Waldorf Astoria CPAC convention. Like, uh, I... I uh, I think, if anything, it's proven that the people who are inclined enough to go to a Republican convention, basically, like a, a non, not the GOP convention, but just sort of like a yearly convention of fandom for the GOP, yeah, is going to be heavily Trump-based right Very now. Very much so. And you know what? I, I uh, What I found really interesting about it was that, you know, they we're polling the people there about like 
how they felt if Trump was on the ballot versus Trump not being on the ballot and everything like that. Overall, 94% of people who attended CPAC and filled out this questionnaire said they had a favorable opinion of Trump. Yep. Uh, 65% of them, or 65% of the people who attended, not just the 94% there, but 65 of the total number, said that they would vote for Trump again. Uh and like 50, no questions asked Basically, yeah no question yeah, right now. it doesn't matter who else is on the ballot i vote for trump and then 55 said uh i think about it but it would depend on who was on the ballot which is like so it sounds like this was like the super trumpy crazy cpac uh yeah. this year but i i do think that that kind of puts worry in my head because if you were saying to yourself as trump i won 70 something million votes right mhm uh, and of my most fanatical Perfect. supporters, yeah, only sixty five percent of them are one hundred percent in for the next round. You're not you're not giving yourself the the chances as much as like it doesn't seem like the the base is as riled up as it had been before. I think he looks at that room though, and he says, "I only need half of you." Because mm. I got a bunch of people out there that this hotel would not let through the front door. <laughs> we tried and those to put, people. We tried to put this old Nazi sign on the floor, and they didn't. They didn't come. <laughs> I mean, it was like that the Pied or, Piper of racism. You know, he's uh, he's got a whole bunch of people who are on no fly list now, so it's not like they could come to CPAC after the True. fact. They, you know, <laughs> they're being blocked from travel. Not to Mexico, but, you know, inside the United States, especially in D.C. So, uh, you know, I think. That, well, this that, one was in Florida, so. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, so he's been fine. Uh, but 50%, I think, is a strong showing there. The bigger thing for me was that every speaker, every single speaker, is a believer in the big lie. And yeah. that seemed to be the message of the time, is that, like, our CPAC convention this year, we're going to talk about the big lie, we're going to push the big lie, and we want you thinking about the big lie for the next year. And I hate saying the big lie, because, I mean, that's like a the house managers figured picked up that term and, like, pushed it, but... I don't know how else to refer to it. Like, he didn't win. There was no fraud. He lost the presidency. So it's a lie. Yeah. And it's the lie that they're all sticking to. So. Well, I mean, the big lie has always gone back to the uh, the principle of you could tell a lie big enough and enough times that soon enough everyone would believe it. Um, and, you know, under that pretense, yes, I totally get where they're coming from here, but I... I, I do. I, I also don't like it because it sort of sounds like a like a, I'm with Ike or <laughs> like I like Ike kind of thing. Like it's like a slogan yeah. more than more than a real ideal of how the election went through. I I just I don't understand how you think that there's still something wrong. Not you, but, you know, the person you, who the thinks. The, yes. The yeah. person who thinks that there's something wrong with the election is still holding on to that because like. We would know by now. Yeah. Especially, There's no reason to keep the secret yeah. anymore. We, we got it. We won. Especially considering that, like, the closest of the states, Georgia, was counted multiple times, including by hand. Yeah. And, like, it, you know, it, it, if you think that... It, I can understand how somebody could get to you and make you think that, like, in a Dominion voting machine changed votes or something. Like, how that could happen because... You know, there's bugs and, and you, you have a cell phone and there's bugs in that all the time. Something happened. Your camera stopped working. Like what? You know, like I can only open Instagram like maybe three days a week because they send an update that just tanks it on my phone. And then yeah, so every, everyone stuff. understands how technology can go awry. But then, you know, like once they hand count them, that <laughs> argument's kind of out. Right. Like, <laughs> so, I won't I, I, I won't ever listen. understand these people who are just like. No, no, no. The hand counting was fucked up too. Like they, fu <laughs> they fucked up to almost the ex same exact number that the Dominion voting machines fucked up. Like, yes, listen. <laughs> one for Biden, one for Trump, one for Biden, one for the trash. I saw, <laughs> I saw the count go down. I know how it happened. But the uh, the Golden Globes and CPAC are both become are both essentially organizations that at one time may have served a purpose. Uh, are most certainly almost all white if not all white completely <laughs> and will continue to be an embarrassment going into the future. I think those things that they have in common and they can continue to live in that world if they want to. Yeah. I, I would be more in favor of the golden globes sticking around though, as opposed to CPAC. I mean, <laughs> if we only can lose one. Yeah. If it's a choice, cause you know, like, 
you know, the Golden I'd Globes. Like to win, you'd like to win a Golden Globe. I, I understand. I'm yes. not. I'm not saying I wouldn't win. You know, like I'm not gonna slide a bag of money across the table. But if somebody wants to reward me for my genius, then what am I to? Who am I to say no? Okay, so let me get this straight. <laughs> You're not gonna slide the bag of money across the table. But if someone was willing to slide a bag of money across the table with your name on it, hey, well, what then... I don't know doesn't hurt. Like, uh, <laughs> listen, you remain the artiste. I understand. Yes. <laughs> That's if somebody fine. if somebody wants to pay for me to run for president, who am I to take a, look away their donations? You know, like, all right. Well, so beyond CPAC and the Golden Globes, there were two other stories I wanted to touch on this week. Uh, both of them just briefly. One, uh, there is a school in Arkansas that just today uh, had the very first shooting, school shooting uh, of twenty twenty one, and I think part of me was like, sadly, was like, wow, we made it to March without a school shooting. And then immediately I said, wait, like 70% of schools are not in session. So that's probably not, uh, or not like physically going to a school building. Yeah. So that's probably not as good as I thought. And it pushed me down this rabbit hole of like, well, what, what was 2020 like when most kids were home for most of the year and school shootings were down to zero, you might ask? No, to 25. There were 25 school shootings, uh, essentially in about 40 days of in-person con- uh school last year so it happened at different places different times but the u.s school children averaged 40 days of in student uh instruction last year whether it was before covid or at some time during covid the middle of the year end of the year i mean california we were in school for a while before they actually shut it down when things were terrible out east they were still like oh we're fine here it doesn't matter yeah the the cases hadn't really gotten to us yet and the yeah. schools were still open at that point. But I remember there was a point where New York was closed and L.A. was still open. Yep. And yeah. then for a while, New York reopened and L.A. was like, no, we are not reopening. And then New York closed again because yeah. uh, it was bad. But, but so they 40 kept, days the kept the bars open. Kept the bars <laughs> open. Well, because, uh, you know, those are the voters. Fuck these kids. <laughs> voters are ones who go to the bars. Um, but so in 40 days of instruction, there were 25 school shootings, which is sad yeah. But also very low. Uh, wait, so there was about one school shooting per day or per two days of instruction. 2018, we were running at a rate of about one per day of school instruction. So, you know, um, things are fucked. And I think you said it aptly in our, our kind of like setup call, our pre-show meeting call, where you were just like... Uh, not only do we have the stuff from before that was causing school shootings at the rate of one per day, but now we have a bunch of kids who have for eight months, 12 months, maybe more for some kids just had unaddressed mental health issues caused by COVID now being pushed back into an instructional environment. And we have no idea how that's going to impact. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really concerned about the children going forward because there's already been a lot about people having more mental health issues as related to not seeing their friends, not going to school, not having that normal interaction that I think all people really need to some degree. Like you might be the type of person who wants to be a loner, but you still want to have a couple people around to <laughs> to, to feel alive at some point. Um, and I, I just feel like, you know, the, the mental health issues that would rise from an event like this are going to have catastrophic impacts on the other side when schools are open like they had been before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, more than anything, I, I really wonder about just, it, I haven't like looked into this too much, but just sort of from my own perspective of mental health issues, like I'm, I'm not, I don't have very bad problems like a lot of people do, but you know, I you can have a mild depression every once in a while. Uh, I get into that state where I'm like nobody likes me, and sometimes I feel like that's because I don't see other people. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like you sort of get into that stage where it's just like, oh, Rob hasn't physically been in my presence for two weeks, so he might hate me now. But like, that's the well, type I of hated thing. you even when I well, saw you most more often than that. <laughs> that's the type of thing that like you know. It, you can you can brush off if you're a little bit uh, more 35. stable in your yeah. in your mental health. You can sort of say like, no, 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 I'm just getting ridiculous. I'm just saying these things. Uh, of course, now Rob's giving me a complex, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
You say Ladies, like, imagine <laughs> what it's like to date me. Hey. You can uh you can put together you can put together in your mind like how somebody who isn't able to properly compartmentalize these feelings could develop something that would hurt themselves or others. And I, I think that a big thing we're all going to have to deal with on the other side of COVID is the mental health crisis of not just the children who are sort of like being stripped of their ability to learn how to be people. Cause school more than I, sure you learn, you know, like what the Magna Carta is and stuff like that. And Heidre- Corey, what's a Magna Carta? <laughs> um, so anyway, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just, uh, I think that, we're, we're gonna. So you were saying you learn how to be people. While yeah, you're, when you're it's in not just well. about the knowledge you learn. It's about learning how to interact with other people and to make friends and to deal with, you know, problems and you know everything that will set you up for being, you know, the person you will be once you leave school. So yeah, I, I, I and, just and so I I'm not so involved with high schoolers, but obviously I have a three year old going on four year old in my life that essentially went to started going to what he called school, which was like an advanced daycare center where they treat it like school, but it's daycare. And he had that for three months from his birthday until March, essentially before they shut down. Yeah. And so now I'm like reading reports and buying these books that are written by psychologists that are like, here's what you can expect when someone's uh, interrupted basically where they, they start their social development and then you have to pull them out and then, Oh wait, now we're going to shove you back in. So it's just been you and mom for a while. And mom just, of course, loves you no matter what you do, even when you scream and punch her in the face, she still loves you. Um, and kids aren't going to love you if you scream and punch them in the yeah. face. So, uh, so I, I, I'm buying these books and sending them to him, to my sister. Like, all right, so here's one about anxiety and how to deal with anxiety. And it's like, I know that you and I probably never thought about anxiety when we were four, but this is a whole thing where like people he knows have died. Like I didn't have to deal with, Oh, miss so-and-so not going to be around anymore when I was four. Like every, my first death was high school when I lost somebody close to me. So I don't know any, how he's going to deal with that. Anything I can do. Here's a book. Here's about how he, to, uh, transition back to being around other people. (laughs) Well, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you. One thing is that I think that, more than anything, it's there's reps involved with seeing other people. Yeah. And I know that when I was a kid, if I felt like I misspoke in front of somebody else, it would weigh on me all day. I'd be yeah, like, but you, you'd get another shot the next day, though. Yeah. But, you know, and eventually you'd be like, you know, like, oh, maybe I can cover for this. I can be a nice person and cover for <laughs> the stupid thing I said that one time. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like even I, I, I when I went to go pick up lunch earlier. I had a moment where, like, I opened the door and one of the employees was walking out of the door. Uh, and for whatever reason, I felt like I needed to tell her that I was there to pick up my food. And she was yeah, in the middle yeah. of doing something else. But, like, I opened the door and I'm just like, hi, here to pick up for Corey. She's like, okay, just go up to the counter. And I'm like, right, I'm not interacting with enough people. I do stupid things. And this is the type of thing that would normally weigh on me. And if right. I was a kid, yeah. if I was like, you know, in seventh grade, it would really bother me for like probably a week or so. Just laying in bed, <laughs> like, why did I say Until that? I could see that person why? again and just be like, I need to recover from this awful moment. You know, it's like the <laughs> the Uber driver dropping you off at the airport. It's like, have a safe flight. Yeah, you too. You like, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do I recover from this? <laughs> Yeah, but uh, you know, in seventh grade, you'd be like, "All right, so I'm gonna go back to that place," and then you go in. That same person is behind the counter, and she's like, "Here to pick up," and you're like, "Having a great day. How's your day?" And then you're like, "Fuck." Yes. Uh, order for Corey, please. And then you're just laying in bed, like, "All right, so two. All right, two out of three. I fucked both of the two. How high do I have to go to make up for this?" But uh, yeah, so, listen, it, it's. I think that that's absolutely right. We don't know how this is going to impact kids and we weren't in a good place before. We're not coming out of a place where it's like, Hey, we got school shootings down to one a year. Yeah. We were I, at one a day and now we have a whole new batch of mental health problems on top of it. I, I, I would say that the best way to get through it is if everyone could just agree to be kind and patient with people. <laughs> <Or> the, bro- <laughs> the, bro- the problem is that's like, 
how, how, why do I even bother suggesting that it's not going to happen? Like, you know, like, do you have a TikTok? Because I'm not sure you're in with the movement right now. Do you, I, don't think, I don't know if you're down with the culture. No, but it's like, you know, like when you when you used to see a kid and they would say something to you, just like, you know, like a Tyrannosaurus is a dinosaur. Like, yeah. you know, you don't go like, shut up. I know this already. Like, <laughs> you go like, so, oh, that's great. Thank you for telling me, like, you know, you and I are of the generation where we say, oh, that's great. <laughs> I saw a grown man argue with a child <laughs> about dinosaurs <laughs> and the child was correct. And I didn't want to have to go over there and just like, how is, what's that going to do to that man's mental health? That I'm 22 <laughs> and this eight year old is more correct about this subject. And I am trying to school him on it, but I really wanted to see, I'm too nice. <laughs> I'm not really that nice even, but I wanted to go over there and be like, just so you know, uh, kid, you're absolutely right. Keep it up. Study hard. You, don't reproduce. Let's just <laughs> cut this off at the root if we can. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so, but other other uh, issues of violence in our society, not only just shootings in uh, schools, but, hey, the country as a whole. Now, listen, we haven't gotten a stimulus yet. We don't have a real plan for vaccinating all of America yet. Uh, there are problems running rampant all across this country, not including systematic racism and uh, the police, which are both still issues. The yeah. courts. Uh, I watched too many documentaries in the last week to even name all the subjects. But one problem we're not going to have in the future is Iranians in Syria attacking American troops because we drop bombs on them and they're dead. And that will solve the problem once and for all, as history has us. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. a proportional response equals no more violence ever. I think that's that's yep. basically it's rule yep. number one, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, if you ask the U.N., if you ask the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense, that's how we do it. It's like, listen, they take two of ours. We take 20 of theirs and then it's done forever. Yeah. There's no blood feud. <laughs> it's fine. I. Uh, we we wondered exactly what level of same old same old president we were going to have with biden and listen uh i, I think the book is still early to tell generally speaking how this is all going to go sure. but the idea that we're we're concerning ourselves with the sort of proportionate response style of military interventionism is not something that i necessarily wanted to go back to uh i was hoping that maybe we could have a new a new break, but at the same time, I knew that Biden was, you know, of the same cloth of every president I've ever known in my lifetime. So the likelihood of him being deciding to change things up was not going to happen. Like, I want to shock you with something. Yeah. I was hoping that Biden would be more like Ronald Reagan. <laughs> what? what you say? <laughs> what? How so? Because cocaine was widely available and very cheap? Well, yes. But also because uh, when American troops were killed uh, in... Because uh, it was damn. so much easier to get the attention of Jodie Foster? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, it's not Syria. Uh, Lebanon. When American troops were killed in Lebanon, uh, Reagan was just like, okay, let's bring our boys home. You don't want us there? We're going to leave. Now... He also had an interventionist policy in a lot of places because he left Lebanon and invaded Grenada, which was just an island yeah. that needed to be invaded for reasons that only Reagan understood, mainly that he needed to get reelected. But uh, and a thousand people died. By the way, uh, the staircase, the girls who were adopted by the guy, their father was killed in Grenada. He was one of the thousand Americans killed in the invasion of Grenada. <laughs> Amazing. It's that, that's what sent me back down that rabbit hole. But so he basically said they were going to blow up our, our Marine barracks in uh, Lebanon. We're going to pull out and now we're going to leave them to themselves. And turns out, uh, although you, some may disagree, uh, it turned out pretty all right. The Lebanese settled their civil war. They established a government. Uh, they are very anti-Israel. That part's probably not great if you're you know looking for peace in the Middle East, but as far as it's concerned, Lebanon itself is relatively stable, especially compared to Syria now. Um, but uh, we invaded Grenada and they've never recovered. And we were in Colombia and Nicaragua and uh, all over the Southeast Asia and South, and South America. And those places are in terrible shape now, wherever we uh, were interdicting ourselves. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Biden could be more like Reagan. It, the first thing, just the one example of like, 
All right. So you're saying you and you're telling me proportionate response. My response is going to be we're pulling our boys out and uh, good luck. Yeah. I mean, there's always been a a kind of the the the, sh- the recent history of U.S. foreign interference has always been like, hey, this really big kid is picking on this little kid. I'm going to go defend the little kid. And yeah. then it became uh, like the. Like, hey, this little kid all on his own is deciding to have his own, like, government that's different than what we want, so we're going to go interfere with it. Like, yeah. there's a lot of, like, it started off like, oh, we're going to have the back of everyone who who can't defend themselves kind of thing. And then it quickly became, we know how to pick winners, so we're going to go out there and pick winners. And there's times where I wonder if, like, like you can't leave Iraq. Like, so part of this was... Uh, you know, it, it happened, the bombing happened in Syria, but it was Iran fighters, uh, who were helping train, you know, all this is alleged. So t- yes. this is from the DOD. So I, I don't, you know, until I get better information, I don't know what to tell you, but, uh, the idea being that <clears throat> the, uh, in Syria, the, uh, Iranians were training Iraqi counterinsurgent fighters, uh, yeah. to take out U.S. troops in Iraq. So the U.S. can't leave Iraq because we've sort of created a mess and we have to fix it. But if it was another situation, there is like this kind of world where if the U.S. was just like, you know what, fuck it, we're done, we're leaving. And then everyone in the Middle East starts doing the like, oh, wait a minute, no, no, you can't leave. Just yet. We won't do it again, I promise. Like, you know, there's there's a little bit of like, if you threaten to pull out, then maybe they'll they'll yeah. shape up which is what Reagan did a couple times. Well, uh, I, I think the part of that though is when we threaten to pull out, the people who are like looking at it and saying, I want to be strong, we are not dealing with those people. And oftentimes those people are just a different religious sect than them. That's yeah. why there's violence. And the US says, uh, and by the way, I think your example is apt. There was a pillow fight happening between a bully and a smaller kid. And the US comes in and hits the bully on the head with a hammer. And now, Nobody knows the pecking order around here anymore. And then we were like, well, we'll just pick who's in charge because we're really good at that. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you would do that. Um, and then sometimes the people would say, we actually don't agree with that. We're going to pick somebody else. And then we would assassinate that person and put our guy back in charge Yeah, because uh, that's what we do. But I think a little bit of us just saying, listen, here's the date. We're pulling out. You guys got to settle up. It's up to you. And that brings people to the table. They're like, okay, so if we don't have American troops, we're not ready to defend ourselves. That means civil war. Or uh, maybe the fact that I'm Sunni and you're Shia doesn't really make that big of a difference and we should come to some kind of coalition government here. Uh, and maybe we should say, you know, Iraq shouldn't be a country. Um, the North should become Kurdistan along with probably parts of Turkey and go to the Kurds. And the East should go to the Shia and they can create their own state that is very similar and probably supported by Iran. And the West will be a Sunni state and will be supported by Jordan and Saudi Arabia. And maybe it's not, uh, maybe it is called cutting it into a desert and calling it peace, but it's still peace. But we are so, we've made this mess now. And we feel like we, I could fix this. I could fix it. It's like when you fuck up a recipe and you're like, all right, so that was way too much salt. What do I need to put into this to undo the salt? And it's just going to get worse and get worse. See, but every a, every attempt hopefully gets you to a better solution. But the problem is that every <laughs> single time you're attempting it, you're cooking a different recipe. Yes. So you're yeah. just like, oh, I put too much salt in that cake, so I shouldn't do it for my fries. And then you realize you fucked up the fries now, too, because you didn't put <laughs> enough salt. In. Like the 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 long run problem with the with U.S. interference and in other countries affairs is that you're going to end up with like trying to learn lessons from one country which don't apply to another like you know like nothing about what you learned in vietnam is going to help you in colombia you know like yeah there's just well how about this how about this (laughs) every time we enter we have interdiction in a country it's america saying i really like an omelet for breakfast all right omelets almost ready let me flip it and scrambled eggs so maybe we should just go in (laughs) saying i'm gonna have scrambled eggs for breakfast and understand that that's what it's gonna be (laughs) <laughs> or don't make breakfast. Skip breakfast like I do. Or we could just go to the to the uh <laughs> to the idea of like the Canada version where it's just like, hey, don't make me come over there. It's like you ain't coming over here. It's like fine, we weren't coming over there. <laughs> <laughs> 
I but mean, we yeah, told that's... you not to let us come over. There. Just so it's clear, we drew a line in the sand and we did not cross it. We we told you how we felt about it and then did nothing about it. <laughs> well, it sounds a lot like you're talking about uh, our COVID response going no. here in the United States, uh, which is, of course, the last big news story of the week. Uh, and I guess in several parts, the first part being, um, as I pointed out, we found the money to bomb Syria, still haven't found the money for a stimulus. So listen. Uh, for people like me who've been working throughout the pandemic and who have suffered almost no repercussions economically of uh, the pandemic itself, uh, the risk, super high and not really happy about it. But economically, I'm doing better than ever. I have enough money saved now that I can move to uh, Belize for three years and just not work and just live. Uh, thanks, John McAfee. Uh for giving me the guidance on where I should go <laughs> and how much it costs to be there. So I, I'm doing fine. I There's a lot of Americans who are not, though. Sometimes I feel like your YouTube history, kind of like YouTube knows when two people are friends and they start putting over <laughs> some videos from one to the other. He's, he's going to talk about this. You need I get to watch a, this. I get a remarkable amount of YouTube videos where the cover image is like one per, like a guy <laughs> smiling with like a $5 bill, and he's just like, my life in Belize. And I'm like... Or, or uh, Google saying, Rob your friend's this, about so to make a terrible cool. decision. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should, you should stop him it. from doing this. <laughs> uh, so there's a, no COVID stimulus. Uh, not yet. Senate I mean, or, still we, we have that we have that House voted on uh, their portion of it. We're going to see what happens with the Senate. Uh, yes. Right now, the most conservative or most moderate, I guess, members of the Democratic Senate are sort of holding out for their issues like it, it, Chris and cinema uh fucking uh what's his face in West Virginia uh why did I forget Warren Hatch no that was uh no, Utah Warren Hatch. no yeah what's uh, the bird Robert bird <laughs> that's another what we're talking about? that was another West Virginia uh mansion uh, okay. Joe Mansion that's who I was thinking yeah, of uh Joe Mansion Chris and cinema they're sort of holding up the Democratic side uh and then uh, uh, on almost any issue, it seems like where the Democrats could just come together and get something passed, there's somebody who's holding them up, including uh, Dianne Feinstein has done that about the filibus filibuster. Uh, again, proving that Dianne Feinstein really needs to fucking go. But yes, can we vote her out, please, Corey? If you, who is the California if president? Dianne Feinstein and Joe Manchin are effectively the same person. And one of them has to worry about getting elected in West Virginia, and the other one absolutely does not. Then we have in California. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Christ. Yeah. Uh, so I, I had on the schedule for us to talk about uh, the 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 filibuster and the parliamentarian, and uh, yeah, well, we're going to skip over that because I, I still think we have time for it. In the end, it comes down to this: it's about rules, and you can change the rules of the Senate, but you have to have support. And the Dems have a 50 plus one majority right now where the 50 uh, as it has been historically isn't united about anything. So they can barely get some good stuff done. Here's the reality. The $15 minimum wage hike will not survive the bill. The COVID no. bill will move forward. Eventually it'll have money in it for different stuff. It won't be the $15 minimum wage. And when I say eventually, I mean at some point, cause right now we're looking at an April rollout of the stimulus, if at all. So we may be through, 50% of the vaccinations or more because we we hit 50 million of the 100 million this week. So maybe more, 50% before we hit the stimulus that was supposed to come months ago. Yeah. In the depths of the uh, COVID pandemic. So uh, I said this in the pre-show meeting. This is no way to run a government. This is no way to run anything. But the fact that this is how our government runs makes me sad. And it should make everybody sad. This is what you vote for. This is what your tax dollars are going for. And Every day, I recognize the irony with which I say this, every day that we do not march on D.C., <laughs> drag them out and hang them and vote new people in is a missed opportunity. See, I don't I, I'm beyond the point of of changing the system that we currently have, because the same things that allowed the problems to rise to the top will happen over and over again. So, Revolution. I hear you, Corey. I'm with you. <laughs> Let's overthrow the whole damn system. The whole damn system's corrupt. We got to get rid of the whole system. I think I think the problem is that we 
no system would fix it though either. When the revolution I, I, starts, <laughs> let it be known, Corey <laughs> Baker started it right here. First of all, I think uh, I think nobody will believe you say. <laughs> be like Trump being like. <laughs> Trump being like, I didn't do it. She did it. She sexually harassed herself. <laughs> Listen, every conspiracy I didn't needs follow a Patsy, her, Corey. I didn't follow her into the women's changing room. She went into the women's changing room, and she did it to herself. <laughs> every conspiracy needs a Patsy, and I think I just found mine. So, you know. Listen, good but, news, though. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was uh, just on the last point on the stimulus, though. Like, I, I think that. Eventually, we'll get there. There's going to be some hand wringing about certain parts of it. And since the parliamentarian has thrown out the minimum wage, which seems to be one of the bigger sticking points, mostly to, you know, and <laughs> while I think the minimum wage needs to be increased, the national yes. minimum wage, uh, yes. I can understand somebody like, uh, fuck, I forgot his name again already. Uh, Joe, from Manchin? West, Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Uh not Steel wanting cut. to not wanting to double the cost of the minimum wage in a state that is poorer yep. as opposed to a state like like you know like you would say to yourself like well it needs to be 15 in California and it will be because the state of California has passed individual laws that will bring the state minimum wage yes. to 15 New York has done the same uh I think that the there's while I think we should work on a system that would eventually get everyone to 15 I don't know if the the idea of every single year bringing up a little bit and then 10 years from now or five years from now we have $15 in West Virginia makes a lot of sense because if you raise it by a dollar an hour over 10 employees over the course of a year, you're talking about, you know, $16,000 that you're adding to your payroll costs, which, you know, you think you can afford you know, everyone thinks every business can afford it but not every bit you know like a, a tackle shop is not the same as a mcdonald's you know let's not get into that because right. they can't afford it they can't afford it uh but i'm not going to get into that today because i don't want to embarrass you more than one time <laughs> and i've already done it so many times today so let's just say uh aside from that i think that their mansion is right in the fact that people need assistance now unemployment insurance rent uh, eviction protection these important things that are in the bill, this is not the hill to die on, on this particular bill. Like, yes, we need to increase the minimum wage. It doesn't have to be now. Yeah. And there is things in this bill we need now. So let's pull it out. Maybe we can even get some Republicans to vote for this. And we don't need to bring the VP over from Annapolis. Let's just figure out what we can agree on in this bill and get it done. And yes, everybody ideally would love all these great things. But again, this is the government that you voted for. So this is the government that we have. Yeah. And every day that we leave them in power, they should do things like this. I think, unbelievably, I agree with Joe Manchin. Not that it shouldn't be raised, because I think it should be raised nationally, and I can explain to you why if we have more time, but that this is not the place to do it. When If the, if the rules allow it, fuck it. Let's fight it, and let's just get it done. But if it doesn't allow it, the parliamentarian has ruled, so – Unlike the Republicans during the uh, impeachment trial, let's just say it's been settled. That vote is done. Let's vote on the rest of the bill and be done with it yeah. uh, so we can pe get some assistance to people. So and, you know, kind of in the same vein, Johnson and Johnson got their emergency uh, use declaration from the FDA. So, uh, again, getting to that idea of like, let's just get help to people now. Not that we don't have enough vaccine because we've purchased enough for every American to get two at this point. But Johnson & Johnson is one dose. It doesn't need to be chilled at negative 90, so it's a lot easier to get out to places. Yeah, just um, regular refrigeration will do. And I, you had an interesting point, and I can't remember it, So I, the about people going shopping for vaccines and why that might happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard it. I've heard people saying, like, you know, like, oh, I want the Pfizer or over the Moderna or like, I don't want the Johnson and Johnson. I would rather have the Pfizer or Moderna. And I think a lot of people are hearing about these efficacy rates where, you know, like Pfizer and Moderna were like 95, 94%. Whereas the Johnson and Johnson one was 66% or something like that. 70% yeah. somewhere in that area. I think. If I yeah. Remember, yeah. Uh, and I would say, don't worry about it that much. It, just personally speaking, I, I'm not a yeah. doctor. I'm just going off of the the information that I receive from other doctors and scientists. Uh, the the most important part 
the reason why this is a miracle and we should be treating it more like a miracle is that uh number one we got this vaccine in record time and it's not because all of a sudden we finagled some things and made it happen there was a lot of really important innovation that took place in vaccines in the last 10 years that have made this possible yeah uh so that's number one number two uh just because you hear 90 something for pfizer and moderna and then 70 something for johnson and johnson doesn't necessarily mean that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is less capable of keeping you from dying from coronavirus mm-hmm. because so far uh, from all the people who have been in clinical trials that have been like, you know, like they follow these people after the trial is over to see what the long term effects are. Nobody has gotten seriously ill, like hospital ridden yes. ill after the vaccine no has taken fold. And yeah, no deaths. Yeah. So. If we can go, there was the talk at the beginning of the, the the whole pandemic where it was like, well, if you're young and healthy and you get it and it's like you have a bad cold for a week or like a flu, like why wouldn't you yeah. just get it and then you're immune and you're good? <laughs> like <clears throat> that kind of logic. I believe I may have said that. Yes, I may have said that at the beginning. <laughs> that kind of logic can sort of be replaced by the vaccine of any of these ilk because they can all yeah. basically do the thing where it, it gives you the immunity with very little side effects and allows you to go back to living your life. Like, yep. And, and listen, you could, if, if you don't want the J and J, that's fine. I'll take yours. If yeah. you qualify for it, just let me know. I will come and get it because in the end, my concern is death. That's not on my own terms and a serious hospitalization that eats through all my Belize money, and then I have to then go into debt for. <laughs> well, what what amazes me about this whole thing too is just that like, you you, I know that I didn't necessarily want to come on the podcast and start talking about the miracle vaccines that we've created, uh, because I don't want people to think that like you know any vaccine that we were going to get was going to be some miracle drug or something like that, mm-hmm. but there are so many things about the process in which we've gotten from where we were a year ago to where we are right now, which is incredible based off of the yeah. history of medical science. And you know, the, the you'll hear a, a thing every once in a while about like, you know, 97% of the pictures that have ever been taken in the world have been taken in the last year or the last like, oh, no, 10 no, years no. because of <laughs> 90% of the, of the pictures that have been taken have been taken in the last six months and that continues yeah. every six months. We take that many more pictures because we can take so many pictures so often. Right. Like and something, something like that is just like, it's not because we weren't taking pictures before. We just <laughs> never had the ability to take as many as we fucking wanted to <laughs> like yeah. all the time. And uh, like Corey and I grew up in the time where you took 24 and then you you went to the Kodak place and you dropped them off. And then God, had- I hope, you had, to care- okay. you had to carefully make sure that it was all in line before you hit the button because you didn't want to waste one. Yeah. Like- yeah. And maybe you take two or three because you're like, if the light's not quite right, I'll get one. I'll get one good one. Well, in there. I mean, if it was a really serious, mo- like, you know, if it was like a christening or something like that or a oh, first yeah. communion, you take a couple of the same one because every once in a while there would be a problem with development in the lab. Yeah. And you don't want to lose true, yeah. that one really good picture you took of all the grandparents. <laughs> So you take a yeah. couple just in case the lab fucks one up. You got you got extras. Um, it was the dark ages, people. You have no idea. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, it, it it's really amazing that we're at this point, and like, we should really be super thankful for everything that happened. Uh, Rob and I used to get into NASA conversations all the time. Let's not do it again now because we, we don't got time do. for that. We still we do. Don't got time for that. But Landed one of, on Mars, helicopters on Mars, <laughs> motherfucker. That's all I'm saying. All right. The one thing, the one thing Rob would constantly come back at me for whenever I would say, "Why are we giving NASA so much money to blow shit up?" Is he would say, you know, like, "Oh, in 1972, they were trying to discover this, but because of the money they spend in NASA, they discovered this instead, and now because of that, we have." the internet or whatever like whatever thing came from a discovery that started from some mistake from nasa the internet's Uh, one of them by the way yes um and that's kind of where we are in just the fact that we've committed enough matter uh money and energy into medical research that we've been able to create these vaccines again i I always fuck it up mrna 
vaccines? mRNA. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's the, the big news is this is the first, and I didn't realize that it's the first mRNA vaccine ever. Yeah. And they're saying that like Pfizer and uh, Moderna are going to probably lose money on this vaccine because all the resources they put in, they can never make it back. Cause once everybody gets one, then it's like, Oh, that's it. But yeah. they might develop an HIV vaccine based on mRNA technology which was unheard of before. They're like, we'll never be able to get a vaccine for this because the virus is just, it adapts too quickly, it changes. And then they're like, oh, well, this mRNA thing that we're using for COVID would work exactly the same way for HIV. So yeah, uh, as soon as we're done with this whole COVID thing, we're going to dive into that HIV problem yeah. that we've been dealing with for you know 40 years. So, And I mean, you know, just things like it, it, it works like that in a way too because like you might donate to you know a aids based charity or something like that for money to go to aids research but the things that they discover while they're trying to work on the aids research is something that helps covid vaccines like you know the the yeah. the way you never know where it's going to end up you know like where the discovery will eventually get you but this, this mRNA vaccine came out of cancer research because yeah. they've been trying to take uh, the measles virus, reprogram it so that it will attack cancer cells, but leave healthy uh, cells alone so that you don't have to get um, uh, where they put the poison in you. Uh, chemo. Chemo. Yeah. So you don't have to get chemo. So essentially, this will only attack the cells that are cancerous and leave all the other cells alone. There was, another, using- there was another version of that they were trying too, wasn't there? Beyond measles? Oh, they've tried it with a bunch of viruses, but they failed completely. Yeah. But it required mRNA technology, which is how we learned how to do mRNA mRNA stuff. And now they're like, oh, so it failed when trying to treat something, but will work really well in this vaccine arena because we only really need that one protein. Where it failed here, we learned it and we can use it here. And so that's the thing is if you've given your money to the American Cancer Society and you're like, well, we still have cancer, what was – well – the COVID vaccine is in part due to the research they were doing into lung cancer with viruses. So it all works together. And now all, you know, our COVID uh, virus, it sucks that we've gone through all this, but we've learned so much in a 12 month period that may help us medically in the future. Yeah. So uh, if you're out there, if somebody says uh, you can get your Johnson and Johnson vaccine right away, but you'd have to wait for your Moderna or Pfizer I would not. Uh, I would not delay. Just get your get your Johnson and Johnson. You'll be fine. Also, just a, a quick note. Just a, something for people to consider. When Pfizer and Moderna started first testing their vaccine, they were mm-hmm. testing when there were way less people and way less cases out there, which yes. is going to change the number of efficient. Like it, it's like saying like, uh, me and Rob have the same car. But his got better gas mileage on a perfect seventy degree day than mine did during a snowstorm, where I was trying to Listen, like go uphill. <laughs> you know, like it's like there's. But if I'm selling the car, it still looks better. That's all I'm saying. There's different yeah. circumstances here. The cars are effectively yeah. the same. The way that they but, they read out the numbers are, are a little bit different. But that's and J and J can say that theirs is effective. Uh, at a high rate against the South African variant, the UK variant, like because during their testing period, they can we they tested with people who had all of these variants, and seventy two percent was the efficacy across all variants. Yeah, Pfizer was done testing essentially by the time we had our first real variant. So get the Pfizer. It also may mean you need a booster in six months and another booster six months after that. Whereas the J and J went, it's like, wait, you're gonna get sick. But it's just like the flu vaccine. Sometimes you get the flu vaccine, and it means when you get the flu, you have two days where you feel kind of crappy instead of nine days where you want to die. Yeah. So. But that, that's the – just get it, please, if you're if yeah. you're listening to it you're curious. Get it. And I, I have – listen, I have a whole thing. I've decided, Corey, I'm going to save it. I'll do my own uh, ranting video about uh, the vaccine rollout because I have thoughts. I know people ask me this week. It's all fucked up, and it's all political, and it all sucks. But I'll put that on my own video this week. So okay, I mean, we can get to it next week. I just didn't want to. I, I we, we during our pre-show we had a a long thing, and most of it was involved with me not understanding exactly what Rob was saying. So he well, was yelling for like a half question. an hour. And then- me asking a question, you giving an answer to a question I didn't ask, me insisting about the question, <laughs> and then you giving a different answer to a question I didn't ask, and then uh, round and round we go. 
I think it like uh it felt like one of those there was a a meme I saw where it was like uh uh, my my wife was really upset, so I came up to her and I asked her, "Do you want me to solve the problem or do you want me to listen?" <laughs> and I think when Rob said that, I was in the like, "I need to solve a problem" stage, and really, what he needed me to do is listen. <laughs> so, like, are you comparing me to Rachel now? Because if so, we're gonna have to turn this off and have <laughs> words. That's all I'm saying. No, I'm just saying I've never been committed to one person for as long as <laughs> as you in my entire <laughs> life. It feels like I've been married to you forever. By the way, uh, I I don't want to, get to go past without mentioning it. It is the 11th anniversary of the fuck turtle incident uh, <laughs> that occurred in Baltimore. So we've mentioned it for the sixth consecutive year on the podcast, the anniversary of fuck turtle. So, yeah, yay. it's been a long time. And by the way, that was, uh, let's see, 11th anniversary means that was seven years into us being friends. <laughs> well... <laughs> if you want to send Rob and me a little something for all our marital bliss, you know where you can go? Wait, wait. Uh, where's that? Oh, theanthem.com. Corey to theanthem.com. Oh, theanthem on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the listener line. 443-219-7595. What's that number again? 443-219-7595. Uh, you can find more of me at my website, CoreyBakerFilmmaker.com, Facebook.com forward, sl- forward slash CoreyBakerFilm, and at LegendCB5 on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, I spent this week reading. I got a new book, uh, the Justin Fenton Gun Trace Task Force book. Uh, and uh, you can still go see Never and Again out on BET Plus and Amazon and wherever you get fine f- films and uh, working on other things. So <laughs> a long string of me saying I'm working on other things, but trust me, I'm working on other things. Right mm-hmm. now it's just staring into the room waiting for Roberto to read my script so I can get <laughs> some goddamn notes. <laughs> okay, to be fair, uh, I do also have the script and I have it open and I have p- notes on like the first 10 sec- ten pages. But, yeah. Uh, that's as far as I made it. Well, I also, uh, I, I have I have been, while I was working on reading Justin Fenn's book, I was also reading a little bit of yours too. So I, have, yeah. I will yeah. have notes for you. Yours is much longer than mine though. So. <laughs> oh, it's multiple things as well. Yeah. I don't know what the most recent things. Oh, it's just the uh, the review of the books, right? Yeah. Uh, which I'll talk about in a second. One question, though. What is the 19th anniversary? What gift do you give people on their 19th anniversary? I don't know. Do you want me to find out? Yeah, look out while I'm talking, because just a reminder, folks, this August will be uh, 19 years. Corey and I have known each other. So 19th Amendment? That's ideas. not what I'm looking for? Uh, nope. No, nope, nobody cares about that one. Uh, so you can find more they were bringing up. Right. By the way, they were bringing up the 10th during CPAC, and I was just like, I wonder what the Google Trends on 10th Amendment is going to be. <laughs> Nobody knows what it is. Who the fuck knows? Uh, By the way, that's why uh, during the uh, things, I, during the uh, unsettledness over the past five years, I've always said, uh, protect the third. I want to go out with a sign that says, enforce the Third Amendment, and just wait for people to ask me because they have no idea what it is. The traditional gift for the 19th year is bronze. So hmm. uh, maybe get you a little bronze statue or something like that. No, I, we don't have to get gift for each other. I was saying if the fans want to give us a gift. I know. I'm saying maybe they can so. get they they can gift a little bronze statue of Rob that will make him. Oh, I, I was going to suggest that uh, I'm putting out these little statues. Uh, uh, it's a it's a commemorative Corbett. You know, that'll be coming out next spring <laughs> with the man buns. <laughs> yes, yeah. So if anybody would like to purchase a Corbett, we'll get those made in bronze instead of gold and send them out as gifts. So. Uh, but uh, you can find more of me at Robert and Cheek on all your social networks. Uh, make sure you check out robertandcheek.com where you can find links to all the, the stuff that I'm doing, including uh, the books, which are available on Amazon. Byrod's books. And uh, on that note, I have now reviewed and edited all three of the original uh, Movement Universe books to have them all republished this year. So people aren't having to pay 40 bucks for a copy of Foe, which is what it's running right now because you can only get it from the secondhand market. So uh, getting those edits reviewed and then getting those things republished. I'm super excited about that. And while Corey has taken uh, a week to get anything done, I shot five videos this week. Uh, one is out today. It's the update on my Sutera pillow review. Uh, and I have reviews, uh, not really reviews, unboxings, if you will, of uh, several products I think might interest people uh, if you get Instagram ads like I do. Kizik shoes, uh, sand cloud towels, uh, update on my mouth armor box, a whole bunch of stuff. So a lot of stuff coming. Keep an eye out for that. Nice. Well, I think we've done good here today. We've done something. I don't know if it's good. But as always, you're listening to the O.D. Anthem podcast, part of the O.D. Anthem digital network. For Corey, this is Rob. Have a great week, everybody. All right. Now to turn the air back on because it is getting stale in here. (laughs) 